Many thanks for joining us and welcome to another episode of The Trading Bell. This week we'll be talking about banking and I'm hosting the Chief Executive Officer of Equity Bank, that is Dr. James Mwangi. But who is James Mwangi? Let's take a look at his profile. Dr. Mwangi is a celebrated African entrepreneur and named by the Financial Times as one of the top 50 thought leaders in emerging markets and among the top 20 most influential people in Africa. He is a career banker with a bias in inclusive finance. He's a certified retail banker and was admitted to the honorary membership of the International Academy of Retail Banking. He's a group managing director and chief executive of Equity Group Holdings. Dr. Mwangi is credited with providing the innovative leadership that has seen Equity Bank transform from a small and technically insolvent building society to one of the largest and most successful digital and inclusive banks in the world. Equity Bank has become the first bank to go fully digital across six countries where the bank operates. Dr. Mwangi is also the founding executive chairman of Equity Group Foundation, the social impact investment arm of Equity Group. Many thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you very much. Such a pleasure to host you on uh, the trading bell for the first time. And uh, you've just released your results, 11 billion shillings in profits. What does this say of the bank? Uh, thank you very much. Um, the profit before tax was 15.5 billion and 11.4 billion shillings uh, for profit uh, after tax. This speaks of the resilience of this bank. Uh, you notice that the banking industry has been going through very challenging uh, times uh, as a result of interest capping and more importantly uh, because of uh, the microeconomic environment and the way they were affected by just our added uh, elections. But the bank has continued to uh, deliver. It has now grown to 12.5 million customers. It's flourishing in five countries. And we see the young subsidiaries uh, following in the steps of Equity Bank uh, Kenya. So three things. Um, it speaks of um, the quality of leadership at the board level. And we're very proud to have um, uh, the, bo the kind of board we have that gives us guidance and develop appropriate policy. It talks also of the quality of executive management. And if you look at um, uh, this phase, the management of uh, equity has been able to distinguish itself and demonstrated how unique it is in terms of responding to a very challenging uh, environment. The third one it speaks of um, the size of the bank. You notice that interest capping removed uh, the yields from 14% uh, to 11%. We lost 40% of uh, interest income. The bank is still resilient because it was never built on margins. It was built on volume. Mm -hmm. So with 12 million, uh, uh, 0.5 million customers, the bank continues to float and to thrive in an environment that is uh, very, very challenging. And lastly, let me say, the bank is one of the most efficient banks uh, on earth. As it said, it has uh, 11, it's then uh, ranked the 11th most efficient bank on earth, mm -hmm. as reflected by return on asset. And this is because of the level of systems that the bank use. It has significantly uh, automated, computerized, and digitized its operations. And that benefit is then passed uh, to the customers, both in terms of uh, financial costs, but more importantly, by the freedom uh, and choice that uh, uh, customers get of when to, to, um, to transact with the bank and from where to transact to the bank. As most people say, equity has ceased to be the place we go to. It's what we do on our phones mm -hmm. and our tablets. All so right. that is what has made the bank <coughs> receive it. And last three is a very loyal customer base of 12 million customers that is responsive and that has a symbiotic relationship with the bank. And I want to, on behalf of equity, to express our gratitude uh, to uh, the loyalty of our customers. All right. And uh, James, uh, looking at your numbers, uh, you're talking about uh, interest income going down by about 40%. And of course, uh, this is an area that is very critical for any serious bank. In terms of uh, what are you going to do differently now that uh, you're still seeing the conversation around the red cap is, is not going here nor there, 
We are not seeing any commitment from government. As a bank, how are you going back to the drawing table? I, two things start out uh, on the way to cope with this situation. We have assumed that uh, interest capping is the new norm. So in all our strategic planning, we're assuming interest capping will be there until it is removed, yeah. interest, uh, uh, we have to comply with the law. So the first one is to ask ourselves, what other services uh, can we give to our customers uh, that uh, are not necessarily in loans? And we have found that the biggest one we could do in conjunction with uh, our agents uh, is uh, our processing transactions for uh, customers. So we have now become the biggest bank in merchant banking. We have become the biggest bank in diaspora banking. Uh, we are a significant bank in trade finance, one of the largest uh, giving LCs guarantees to our customers. We have become very big in uh, foreign exchange, uh, availing uh, foreign currency uh, to our customers, giving treasury products uh, to our customers. So we have really focused uh, on uh, offering uh, other services to uh, our customers. The second one we have said, we can reduce our unit cost. And we have really pressed on the pedal to really grow our subsidiaries so that uh, to cope with the uh, strained situation in Kenya, uh, we can get the benefits uh, in Uganda, Rwanda, Tanzania, DLC, and South Sudan. And that has been a very successful strategy. But lastly, to really sustain this situation long term, We've been thought of focusing on being a very efficient. And we've chosen to become efficient by digitizing the bank, mm -hmm. saying let's remove the fixed cost that we keep on passing to the customers. Let's really remove brick and mortar that is very, very expensive. Let's replace these with a very convenient channel of self-service. Let's put banking. Uh, on the mobile uh, platform of all our customers. Let's put um, banking on internet banking on um, computers and tablets for our corporate customers. And let's al allow them to manage their liquidity, cash and liquidity from their premises. And in the process, we have removed a huge burden uh, that our customers have been calling. And that is why we are able to comply comfortably uh, with the law of capping. We are now we're able to get uh, to give our customers loans at an interest, a maximum interest rate of 13% while we could have pushed the 200 billion shillings to treasury boards, uh, infrastructure boards, and an, an effective interest rate of 165 because they are exempt of uh, tax. So, right. so that efficiency is what we have now passed to the customers. And that is what is subsidizing and making it possible for us to still thrive uh, in an era of interest capping. All right. As much as the rate cap might be repealed, that SME down there in Kawangware, that SME in Karatina, their thinking is interest rates will go up again. So for them, what, what is your message to them? Ideally, banks are not opposed, and personally are not opposed to interest capping. I'm only opposed, and uh, I object, to capping interest at sovereign risk. That's all that we are opposed to. We are saying every customer has their own risk. Allow the market to judge the, uh, the risk of every customer. And, and you can cap uh, in a structured way. The corporates don't need to be protected because they compete with the treasury boards. That's the blue chips. The medium uh, enterprises may be paying 2% above treasury boards. And when we talk about treasury boards, we are not talking about 90 days treasury boards. We are talking about equivalent uh, uh, tenure uh, boards. We are talking about five years because loans are five years. So we're talking about boards that are 12 or 11%. They need to compete. Then we look at uh, the small enterprises. They need to pay maybe uh, 3 or 4% about above government board. That's all that we're asking for, a structure that recognizes risk. But what we did was to commoditize uh, risk. We said every Kenyan has a credit risk equal to their government. Mm -hmm. Nowhere else has it ever been said. That's really you're assuming or neutralizing uh, the forces of market demand and supply, and you're uh, muting 
risk as a consideration in leading. And that is what has really brought us where we are. But let's go back to um, Kenyans would expect uh, leading to go up. It's not going to go up because the bulk of leading is still go to government, and the government is not going to be moved. So if interest rates went two percentage points above where they are, money will move from government to, uh, to leading because leading will be better. If they go 4%, the government will struggle to get money. Yet that will be 14%. 14 uh, 14%. That will be 16 percent. But at the moment, Kenyans are borrowing at 260. Mm -hmm. And uh, simple mathematics says 16 is better than 260. All so, right. but if there is lay, uh, there is um, misconduct in the marketplace, deal with the victims. It's not everybody who is bad. It's like uh, leader is saying you'll poison a liver because you want to catch uh, uh, one person who drinks water from the river. Mm -hmm. You're destroying uh, an ecosystem, you're destroying everybody. So right. deal with the de deviating bank mm -hmm. because there is regulation. But let me also all remind Kenyans that this regulation was never uh, created by government. Central bank was opposed to, uh, against this regulation from day one. Mm -hmm. Treasury was opposed, government was opposed. This was a private member's uh, uh, bill. Yes. before parliament. So yeah. it is not a government regulation. Mm -hmm. And uh, government has always made it clear uh, that uh, it has not been, uh, it is not, it has never worked elsewhere. Right. We have tested, we have piloted, we have seen its impact. C uh, private sector uh, credit growth was growing at 25% uh, uh, two years ago. We are down to 2%. And we have seen uh, uh, GDP growth rate move from 5.8 all the way down to 4.7. And when uh, the bill is tabled to repeal, the finance bill proposes to repeal, How we see uh, enthusiasm. Mm. And uh, certainly, you see the, pro uh, the projected growth rate uh, for this year will be 6.2. Right. But um, I think the biggest um, optimism is coming because also the government is moving away from infrastructure to the lead economy. And it's the real economy that creates economic activities.